All right, everyone, I just want to take a moment to say thank you so much for spending your evening with us tonight. Um, this is our uh, annual Breakfast with the Guys event for the Alberta Council of Women's Shelters, but the first time we've done it at night. Uh, so thanks for joining us um, on online to take part in this active or er, this panel discussion. My name is Jill Shillibier. I'm the Leading Change Call to Action Coordinator for the Alberta Council of Women's Shelters, and I'm joined tonight uh, by my colleague and my co-host, Alyssa Hartwell. Just want to give a few reminders before we get going. I uh, wanted to let you know that tonight's event is being recorded. Um, if you need or if you prefer, live captioning is available just by clicking the live, live transcript button or CC box that you see at the bottom of your screen. You can move the live uh, captioning box around on your screen. So if it happens to be covering uh, a window that you're trying to see, uh, you can just move that across. So the Alberta Council of Women Shelters uh, is an organization that's been serving its 40 member shelters for over 35 years. And along with our members, we have a vision of a world free from violence and abuse. We work towards this vision on two fronts. First, by supporting our members who operate over 50 domestic violence shelters across Alberta through advocacy, through training, and through collaboration. And secondly, we work together to, to prevent and end violence. Leading change is our call to action towards challenging and changing the beliefs and behaviors that perpetuate violence against women and girls. And in our work, we take a strengths-based approach, empowering everyone to lead from where they stand. Our work includes workshop sessions, consultations, research, advocacy, and community conversations like the one we're having here tonight. You can find out about more, or you can find more out about leading change at our website at acws.ca or by contacting us at uh, leadingchange at acws.ca. Alyssa? Thanks. So as Jill said, my name is Alyssa Hartwell and I'm a leading change community developer at the Alberta Council of Women Shelters. On the eve of the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence, with tomorrow marking the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, we are thrilled to be here discussing the ways that we can work together to end violence. Unfortunately, our elder was unable to attend today as she was feeling unwell. However, as an organization committed to truth and reconciliation, we aim to start our gatherings in a good way by acknowledging the lands upon which ACWS is situated and where we live, work and play. We recognize that all Albertans are treaty people and have a responsibility to understand our history so that we can learn from the past, be aware, from, to be aware of the present and create a just and caring future. ACWS celebrates and values the resiliency, successes and teachings that Indigenous people have shown us, as well as the unique contributions of every Albertan. We honour the courage and strength of Indigenous women. We honour them as life givers and caregivers as we honour and learn from their continuing achievements, their consistent strength and their remarkable endurance. Our members serve all nations and all peoples. They are located on Treaty 4, 6, 7 and 8 lands across this province, which includes the six Métis regions of Alberta. I would like to take a moment to welcome everyone who has taken the time to join us today. We want to extend our heartfelt gratitude for all you do in service of our communities. In particular, we would like to thank our board president, Gay Worth, as well as, public mem uh, as the public director, Janice Willier, for being with us tonight. We would also like to thank Leela here, member of the Legislative Assembly for being here tonight. And if any other members of the Legislative Assembly are here, we would like you to let us know in the chat. Finally, we want to thank leaders from across the province uh, who work in violence, the violence prevention sector for being present with us this evening. Before we get into the main portion of our program, we want to acknowledge that domestic violence and gender-based violence are difficult subjects to talk about. Through all of our work at ACWS, we understand that many people, too many people, are experts on this issue through their own lives, and that could very well include folks attending today. We do also wish to acknowledge that while men also experience violence, women and girls still disproportionately experience violence as a part of their daily realities. In this way, we want to highlight that while most violence is perpetrated by men, most men are not violent and all men can be part of the solution and have the power to influence change to eradicate violence in our communities. This event very much seeks to welcome men into the conversation to become active allies in gender-based violence prevention. And now it is my honor to introduce you to my outstanding colleague and friend and our moderator for the evening, Joe Campbell. 
Joe is also a leading change community developer with the Alberta Council of Women's Shelters. A graduate from the social work program at Mount Royal University, Joe is passionate about working with men and boys to explore the intersection of masculinity and violence. Over the last 10 years, Joe has initiated multiple meaningful community conversations about the foundational attitudes and beliefs in our culture that perpetuate violence against women. Through those conversations, he supports men to be catalysts to end violence against women. Over to you, Joe. Thank you so much, uh, Jill and Alyssa, for that introduction. Uh, as you both know, I could not be more excited for tonight. And now you all know that I'm very excited for tonight. Uh, so I echo um, their thanks to all of you for being here uh, for our event tonight. Uh, and, and like Jill said, leading change, what we do is a call to action to stop violence before it happens because we are all impacted um, by domestic violence, uh, whether that be directly or indirectly. Um, this issue is, is so pervasive throughout our culture uh, and you being here tonight, um, you are a part uh, of, of that change. These types of uh, you know, conversations about ending violence have been happening uh, for decades. We all contribute to the elimination of violence in different ways uh, and really uh, make no mistake uh, by being here tonight, being in this conversation, we are a part of something, uh, a movement that's really so much bigger than ourselves. Uh, you know, when it comes to ending domestic violence, uh, we are stronger together. That's a belief of, of ACWS in, in working with, you know, 40 member shelters across the province and also kind of a theme of our conversation tonight when we talk about uh, men's involvement because historically men have been missing from the conversation or around domestic violence prevention. Uh, we're here tonight to talk about creating and forming a, a united front uh, to see this issue as a human issue uh, that we all have a stake in. Uh, and men missing from this conversation, it's, it's, not, it's not new. Uh, and in primary prevention, the Alberta Council of Women's Shelters has been working uh, to address uh, you know, calling men into the conversation since the, the 1980s. Uh, and in 2005, we hosted our first Breakfast with the Guys event, where we invited men to come and come conversation, have conversation, reflect on ways uh, they can be leaders in ending violence against women. Uh, and since then, communities around the province uh, have adopted the event to host their own locally. The model's been replicated actually around the world. Uh, we've had, uh, you know, event chairs, uh, MCs and speakers that have been mayors, professional football players, uh, coaches, managers, police chiefs, uh, media personalities, uh, and, you know, local men who have stood up to share their stories and to speak out about ending violence. Uh, and for our conversation this year uh, and our lineup of speakers is really no different. Uh, and to reflect on uh, our roles um, as men uh, in violence prevention and, and calling folks uh, into the conversation, we, we have a really great group of leaders um, tonight that I am proud to introduce uh, to you. So uh, when I introduce you, uh, please give uh, a wave so people can see you uh, and connect. Uh, and I, I first I want to just quickly welcome, uh, introduce and thank uh, Omar Yacoub, uh, who hails from small town, Alberta. He holds a Doctor of Sacred Letters and an MBA. Omar serves the team at Islamic Family Services, an Imagine Canada accredited charity that is a national leader in holistic social service delivery. Uh, Islamic Family Services is the winner uh, of the Government of Alberta's Inspiration Award for Combating Domestic Violence. Uh, as well as the Canadian Mental Health Association Professional Care Award. Uh, so thank you so much for making time to be here tonight, Omar. Uh, and I look forward to uh, our conversation. Next, I'd like to introduce Jordan Witzel. Jordan dedicates his professional efforts as a community advocate to raising the voices of others from projects that support the mental health of community service personnel to efforts that raise 
visibility for those in the 2S LGBTQI plus community. Jordan is passionate about speaking loudly for those whose voices are often drowned out. Jordan holds a Master of Applied Meteorology from Mississippi State University, a sociology degree from Athabasca University, and a communications diploma from the British Columbia Institute of Technology. Jordan currently works as a communication specialist in the Office of the Vice President of Research at the University of Calgary, while also providing consultations with private firms on weather and climate. Also proud uh, to welcome here today, Todd Crashaw. Todd uh, has, been the, has been active in Alberta's cultural and events scene for 30 years. Uh, he's currently the executive director of the Edmonton Jazz Society, Yarbrough Suite. His first decade long career, however, was as a violence cessation counselor, specializing in family violence prevention and working with batterers in the federal and provincial correctional system. Todd was honored to represent Wings of Providence this past September as a wingman and believes that men from all walks of life in our community need to visibly take leadership roles uh, in confronting the attitudes and systems that continue to support abuse behind closed doors. Uh, and, and last, but certainly not least, uh, I introduce, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Anthony Parker. Uh, and Anthony is a Calgary Stampeders alumni who played nine seasons of professional football with three Canadian Football League uh, clubs and as a wide receiver in the CFL, Anthony racked up over a total of 2,300 yards uh, and 15 touchdowns. Anthony was raised in Okotoks, Alberta, before moving to Calgary to play university football or youth sports with the University of Calgary. While playing for the Dinos, Anthony received two Canada West All-Star selections and was ranked as the best youth sports prospect eligible for the 2011 CFL draft. Uh, Anthony advocates for men speaking out uh, on violence against women uh, and is a trained leading change uh, facilitator uh, through our partnership with the Calgary Stampeders. Uh, so welcome uh, to you, Anthony. Uh, and thank you to all four of our panelists uh, for making the time uh, to be here tonight. Um, again, I want to remind folks, please, throughout our conversation, if, if we're talking about anything uh, that you want to hear more about or dig deeper into, please, I encourage you to use the, the chat. We're going to make time at the end uh, to, to dig a little deeper into some of those topics uh, that you want to hear more about specifically. Uh, so please welcome, uh, I welcome you to do that. So, gentlemen, I do now really think that we are at a point where more men are speaking out about violence against women. Uh, and yet, you know, at events like these, one can question, and I think with all fairness, uh, you know, where are the, the men coming to this conversation? Uh, men have been largely missing, uh, like I've been saying. Um, and we want to talk about really, you know, that, you know, men are missing and why, but also the first steps we can take to get in, uh, get men in the con involved. And I think the million dollar question we're starting out with tonight, and I want to hear from you folks personally, uh, is about that why. Um, you know, why, uh, why are you involved um, with this issue or what inspires you to become, uh, to speak out? Uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn to you, Jordan, uh, to, to uh, start us off. Okay. Pressure's on me first. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Joe, thank you. Uh, thank you for the wonderful introductions. Uh, you know, I've said it offline to the gentleman that, uh, that I share space with tonight, Anthony Omar Todd. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to spend time aside all of you and to see so many people join us tonight to be interested in what we have to say. 
Uh, and so I really do hope we can back that up with at least little nuggets uh, of our experience that might be meaningful for somebody else in this conversation. Um, and looking at that why or that uh, sort of moment that hooked me into the greater cause of advocacy for my community, Joe, and, and looking out for um, nurturing a healthy community that I live in, that I exist in. Um, you know, I, I've just been raised in a, a very fortunate and healthy atmosphere, family atmosphere, um, where the, the, you know, the worst of abuse and, uh, and such was never really observed immediate to me, but I did have my experiences growing up, uh, both myself were facing some, some abuse outside of my, my family, um, makeup and, and, and sort of just seeing how people's experiences as kids really affect the, their outcomes and their interactions with adults. It, it has um, engaged me in just raising a voice for people who feel like they're lost and don't have a voice. They feel like they've had their voice snuffed out at some point in their maturation. And, and I've seen that with friends. I've seen that with colleagues. I've experienced moments of that in my young life where I changed my persona, my characteristics to better, you know, sort of deal with the world around me, to hide from my ego. And I think there's some important little characteristics in there that we'll hopefully flush out through the evening conversation of, of being able to uh, face your own ego with honesty, um, face the, the character that you're putting out to the world with an honest sort of note to it um, in a way that doesn't take space from other people and doesn't impact other people. I'm just inspired to have a very healthy community. And, and so I engage in these conversations, I engage in advocacy, I engage in lifting people's voices out, uh, outwards to the community so that they might sort of reclaim some of the space they've lost at some point in their life. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Jordan. And, you know, you are a person that, that I, I, I can see lives that value of wanting to create uh, that, that healthy community. Uh, and so thanks so, so much uh, for bringing that uh, into light and that, yeah, that, that the lifelong impacts that we can have and how we can change uh, our culture, I think is an important uh, piece. Uh, so thank you. Uh, I want to go, uh, Todd. I see that you've uh, unmuted yourself. Uh, could you could you go next? I certainly can. I think that, um, like echoing a lot of what Jordan has said, everything that has touched me or I've been involved with, part of my driving force in anything I do is being part of something bigger than I am, and I like seeing things from the inside out. And everything that I've done professionally has been about community, and I think that I'm um, experienced enough to have seen that communities are only as strong as some of our most marginalized and vulnerable participants. And the way to enrich in a community is to ensure that there are barriers to success and barriers to inclusion that are actively taken down. Um, I've seen this throughout my um, uh, volunteer leadership roles in the cultural uh, world as well. Um, and I do believe that we are all uh, greater than the sum of our parts, but it's active inclusion that um, without inclusion of individuals who are being able to contribute without dealing with fear or marginalization or ostracization or a fear of violence or a fear of um, um, just not, how, how can I say this plainly? Not that long ago, I worked with uh, a family who was part of a community unit in my profession and these people just seemed like they were lost. They seemed like they were in a fog. And it was only through talking to these individuals. It was a man and a woman in a uh, union with a, a few children. Um, I was friends with them both individually. And it was through talking where I found out that they were suffering some, some aspects of personal abuse within their relationship that echoes outside of their family unit that resulted in a child going to school every day who... Um, Basically, the fear of what was happening happening at home was impeding this person's development into a human being and, and impeding their learning. 
and there was uh, a person who was robust enough to survive some of the abusive behavior who was leading a bit of a shell-shocked life um, and not being able to contribute because of the preoccupation with not only her safety, but that of her son. And I also saw um, a male companion who was struggling and very frustrated. And even though there was a large part of me that was very quick to condemn some of what I was seeing and some of what I was hearing, condemnation alone does not stimulate any type of change of behavior. What did at least start the process of change for him. And it was far bigger than me. There were a number of community members in our small group who were there to provide support, to illustrate the benefits to that individual should they start perceiving their world and their partner and their child differently than what they were. And by changing the perception, it's changing an emotional reaction, especially in uh, stressful circumstances and ultimately leading towards a change in behavior. So that was a relatively fresh thing for me um, about a year and a half ago, and it was um, of great impact. And I think that when it comes to community leadership, especially with men, we, we sometimes talk about microaggressions, and I see aspects of patriarchal behaviors and attitudes that are illustrated through jokes, that are illustrated through offhand comments, illustrated through judgmental types of actions. And I've taken it, I've always kind of taken it to um, be responsible, to challenge those amongst my peer group and challenge those amongst my professional group. Because without, when we're accepting those micro behaviors, all of those micro behaviors add up. And to me, it's just being intolerant, loving the person, but being intolerant to the behavior and creating an unwelcoming space for that behavior while welcoming the person. Uh, and, and doing a separation with that. Um, I, I think everybody benefits from the bigger picture when everyone in a community is feeling safe, secure, uh, able to chase their dreams. And I would rather be part of the solution than the problem. Yes. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, you know, everything you said there from, from, you know, being a part of something, you know, that that's bigger than ourselves to so that, that, that piece about, you know, active inclusion and, and living without fear and that being a right of, of people to uh, engage and go through life. Uh, you know, relating back to what, what Jordan was saying, um, thank you so much um, for, for those words. Uh, Omar, uh, if I could ask you to, to speak uh, around why I know, um, you know, you and your agency have been leaders in this issue and what's kind of inspired you to take on a, a leadership role? To be honest, this was the, the toughest question for me. And I think, I think the word inspire is, is probably the reason why. Inspire can be a very, very daunting word, right? It implies having this spark or a passion, uh, being compelled to action. And I think if people aren't inspired, they can almost feel like they have an excuse not to act. So I think a better framing of the question might be like, what opportunities have we had? And if we think about the opportunities we've had to serve, there's, there's a lot more things we can point to, right? So for me, having had the privilege, the opportunity to work with people who have been doing really incredible work has been such a blessing. You know, the, um, the programs our organization has to combat domestic violence existed before my time with it. And I have the privilege of getting to serve a team and see the work they do and try and think of other opportunities to support them. You know, I have the, the privilege and the opportunity of working uh, and being raised by a mother who's been really active in this space. And you know, as, as the other panelists have mentioned, right, they're, they're the numerous opportunities we have in our social interactions, in our day-to-day -day connections with people to, to address this issue in holistic and meaningful ways. I think that's, that to me is what's more exciting is not the inspiration because inspiration can, can elude us, but opportunities surround us. Thank you, Omar. That was, that was beautiful. Uh, and I love looking at that as opportunities because, um, you know, it's so hard to draw up, you know, about to go to Anthony Parker, but the playbook of how, you know, to, to uh, engage and interact with things. And, and really it's about 
yeah, identifying the opportunities and reacting, um, uh, you know, within that. And I just appreciate that, that word and that sen- those words and that sentiment so much. Um, yeah, and, and Anthony, you know, uh, I want to know, you know, coming fr- from uh, yourself and getting involved, uh, I think, you know, there might sometimes be thoughts around, you know, uh, football players uh, and, you know, speaking out against violence against women, or that might not be something that, uh, that happens, but that's very much not the case uh, for you and lots of the, the folks that uh, I've gotten a chance to work with. Uh, how come? Uh, what inspires you? Or- I think, um, first off, I just want to say, um, you know, tough spot falling up you guys here. Um, tremendous, tremendous uh, stuff that you guys are doing and, and the perspective uh, that you have is, is really, really inspiring. Um, I'll say that for me personally, um, I kind of agree with Omar a little bit in terms of, you know, the word inspire is, uh, is a bit of a tough one because, um, as you said, it, it, it's like almost invokes this, this passion that you have to, to do something. And so, um, the more I kind of reflected on this, um, I think again, opportunity is, is really what it is. And, and for me, what the opportunity is first and foremost is, is family. Um, you know, I have five kids here at home and, um, you know, everybody always looks at me like I'm crazy when I, when I say that. And I think that it's like, there's no better opportunity, uh, to impart a certain, uh, positive way of life or a positive way of looking at the world, um, than to look at your kids and see that you're everything they've got, right. Their perspective, how they see you is the first and most important, uh, influence that they'll ever have. And so I think for me, like, that's really, um, what drives me kind of, you know, as you go forward, uh, each and every day, what kind of world do you want them to grow up in? Um, you know, what kind of people do you want them to encounter, uh, when they're outside of, uh, you know, the four walls of, of your world. Right. And so, um, you know, there's a couple points that you guys made there. The one that, the one that one of that jumps out to me, uh, Jordan is, is talking about ego. I think that, um, something that I really derived from my time playing football is, um, you know, when you get, when you get done a game, the question the coach would always ask you is after you're done, you know, and you've put everything out there, can you look in the mirror and say, I gave it my best effort, mm. right? I did everything that I could do, uh, to be successful. Right. And so can I look at myself in the mirror and say, I've presented or projected the best image that I can for my kids so that they're going to go forward and, and do the same. Um, so that one, you know, really, really jumped out to me because, um, you know, the more you think about, you know, drawing up the playbook, as you said there, Joe, um, it really comes down to the effort that you put forward each and every day. That's going to be what others see. So it's not always a big grand gesture. It's not always, um, you know, you got to go in there and be Superman. Um, but your kids, you're their biggest role model. So they're going to sit, they're going to every single item that you do. Like I have one of my boys, the only thing that kid wants to do is play football. Right. And everything I do from, well, dad, how, how come you put your socks like this? How come whatever, like, it doesn't matter. Every little detail stuff that we don't even realize that they're acknowledging. Um, they are, they're absorbing it. They're soaking it up. Um, so even, you know, as, as you said, Todd, the little, little finer details, um, from the off the cuff jokes to um, the music we listen to, to what we watch, to whatever. Um, they're soaking all that up. And so we really need to be cognizant of what image are we portraying? So thanks, Joe. Yeah, no, thank, thank you. And I just, yeah, you know, acting as an example um, for, for other men and those people who look up to us and children, um, I think it is such an important uh, piece for, for men to be talking about uh, when it comes to uh, just just life in general. We don't often, I think men too often will, will not uh, engage in those conversations, uh, which I think we're really hitting on, uh, are, are a great motivation for folks to become involved with this uh, issue and to, to kind of spark um, the passion it takes to, to see the opportunities to become uh, involved. 
Uh, and I want to build or go into, you know, in talking about, you know, why are men, uh, you know, missing or why have men been missing, uh, you know, in hearing you speak to, to uh, experiences that are very common amongst men and roles that men take on. How come, you know, men are missing? What, what's, um, you talked about, you know, the word inspire and implying some kind of passion. And, and what I, I'm curious to know from, from you folks, like, what is the general attitude uh, that you've seen about uh, from men and violence against women? Like, are men sad or angry about violence that's happening? Um, what is that, the attitude? And, and how would that impact a, a guy's ability to become involved? Um, but, no, there you go. Go ahead, Todd. <laughs> I, I was just going to say, I mean, we all know that that violence, especially in families, it transcends socioeconomic strata, uh, class system, professions and jobs. Uh, but I found that I was recently in a professional culture that was um, very much supported by uh, fellows in the energy sector. And it was there was a cultural uh, tendency towards uh, being very stereotypically, you know, an Alberta boy. And apparently that represents a certain, you know, type of dress, a certain type of behavior, a certain type of language that you use. And for those particular individuals in this, you know, subset of the culture, um, any type of emotional intimacy or a demonstration of vulnerability was something that was seen as uh, shameful, something that was hidden. Um, they were far more uh, comfortable, um, you know, calling each other down and engaging in like 50 year old fisticuffs in this weird kind of adult playground type of thing. And whenever some of us would try to steer a conversation towards things that were perhaps a little bit more sensitive, perhaps a little bit more vulnerable, particularly talking about issues of um, uh, racism or classism or sexism, or violence, um, there was a hush because there was, and you could, you could sense even from the strongest individuals there um, who may have had a good position and may, you know, been built and, and, and quote unquote self-made, they're still very much conscious and very afraid of how they're being perceived by their peers. And they shut themselves out of the conversation because in this weird topsy-turvy way, it's not a safe space for them. Um, and I think part of the way to include men and more men into this conversation is to not be afraid to talk about vulnerabilities and to encourage individuals to talk about vulnerabilities. And when they do have that um, uh, experience, to give them the support that, you know, men often are not known for giving other men. Yeah, those that perceived image of what that means and, and showing uh, vulnerability and talking about issues um, like we did that socialization amongst men um, for sure. I could see, you know, that that is a barrier in coming out to, to be a part of the, the conversation. Um, and what you said too about that, that threat of um, yeah, isolation or further disconnection from folks and speaking out about about this, um, it makes it hard to find opportunities to practice uh, being involved for sure. Um, yeah, does anybody else ha have thoughts around uh, this question? Um, yeah, absolutely. But Anthony, Anthony was going to speak first, so I'll let him go. Sure, appreciate it. Um, I mean, I think the thing that that I would say. Um, stands out most to me or there's probably two things um you know the first thing is, is an awareness um you know i do think that there's this um certain environment that's created um by uh just our our day-to-day -day lives as far as uh again what we consume in media um you know what we put out there as far as what's acceptable for our you know in our gender roles or our gender norms um and so i think that uh, awareness is, is part of it, having that awareness and, and just having our eyes opened a little bit. Um, but I think, uh, Todd, you really touched on something for me that, that jumped out. Um, and that's, um, basically being able to, um, understand that our vulnerabilities is not the thing that makes us weak. And so there's this fear of, of weakness, right? And so, and, and, and I think that it's important to understand that the vulnerability isn't the, the thing that makes us weak. It's our inability to acknowledge it, right? Our inability to acknowledge what 
is wrong or what is not okay or what what hurts me can i you know you, you mentioned um you know basically the strength of society ultimately relies on you know some of our most marginalized members and so are we willing to acknowledge that um and are we willing to put ourselves there be seen helping these people who are marginalized um that are the the vulnerable in our society that's ultimately what will make us stronger is being able to accept that acknowledge the things that that weaken us um and that will make us stronger and i think ultimately you know when you when you look at it from a societal perspective it's uh we couldn't be having a more perfect conversation um when you look at what's gone on globally with this pandemic and all the stuff that's going on we've really had an opportunity to see okay you know who are the marginalized in our society um who are the people who didn't have anybody to talk to when they're you know when we're going through a lockdown or we're going through these various things um you know and how can we be of assistance right and i think that when you look at that and go okay really now you look and say okay look at all these people who you know there's they're dealing with mental health issues they're dealing with these various things and it's it's the same people um who we try to not be like when everything was normal right we okay well no those people are they do this thing. So let's not, let's not be like them. Um, and it's kind of an irony that those are the people we can learn the most from. Right. So if we could spend more time trying to understand and accept people, um, I think ultimately we, we'd all be better for it. And we could, you know, go out in society and say, you know what, this is a place that I want to be because these people are willing to understand me, willing to empathize, willing to put themselves in my shoes. Um, and I think that that's really where we need to start is how can we empathize with people, right? How can we understand from their perspective, what are they going through? Um, you know, and talking to kind of that oil and gas kind of thing, kind of, it does, it makes me laugh a little bit because, um, you couldn't be more right. And it couldn't be more parallel to the perceived nature of a football team. You know, there's no more you know, highly masculinized. This is the way it has to be. You got to be, you know, big, strong, fit, whatever. Um, All of these things are, or what society perceives a football player, a professional football player has to be X, Y, Z. Um, And through this whole process, um, you know, being trained in um, as a facilitator in this and speaking with people on a day to day and, you know, developing the tools to just go out and talk about this. I was able to find that there's so many more people that share our thought process, but don't know how to vocalize that and need to be given that opportunity. So, yeah, the, the power of, of opportunity um, is something that, yeah, is coming up in here and that, not knowing what's going to come from conversation, working past um, kind of that, those fears in having that first conversation or practicing that um, involvement is so important. Um, to build uh, on that, and I'm going to come back to you, Jordan. I see Omar, uh, do you, you have thoughts around this uh, question as well in terms of uh, you know, why are men missing and with regards to what our panelists have been saying. Yeah, I I really appreciate what's been said. I was listening to a podcast earlier today about crockpots and how once we took crockpots and we clad them in like fake chrome and made them Instapots, right? We clad it in like masculine elements. It became this universal thing, right? And there's a tendency that when Something's feminine, it's seen as for women. But when something's masculinized, it becomes for everyone. And so my, my point here is, you know, when we think about this issue is how do we see it as a universal issue? And what Todd and Anthony said about vulnerability, I think, is, is really important. I think another important element is when we think about agencies like ACWS and Islamic Family and others, now, we often focus our work on social service and not on social change, right? And so the distinction between those two is social service organizations often focus on the victims, um, but they aren't always 
endowed with resources to tackle the systemic issues. And so if we think about ourselves and our collective ability around social change, I think there's many opportunities, right? So one is universalizing the issue and thinking about, you know, this isn't an issue for someone else. This is my issue. And this is that other person's issue. And we have to address those, those challenges. You know, when we think about the, the elements that lead to, to violence, you know, they're, they're systemic issues often, right? I don't think the vast majority of people are born to be perpetrators. They're not born wrong, right? Oftentimes it's extenuating factors that push someone into an unfortunate situation. And if we think about those extenuating circumstances, you know, are there things we can be doing to, to lessen those strains collectively, right? And that might be a collective strain for someone who's, uh, who's a coworker or a sibling or someone in our acquaintance, you know, it might be just like, oh, I want to just check in on your financial situation and see if you're okay. Now, they might not need your money, but you checking in on them might actually be that thing that creates a positive outlet for them to release anxiety or stress so it's not released wrongly. Yeah, we need to, we need to see those spaces for, for sure, Omar, where we, men can go uh, and safely start to like have these conversations, break things down. And like you said, really start to pick away at that social change uh, and creating, um, creating um, actual tangible change in the way we show up in um, relationships and having it be more than just not being uh, abusive. Um, in how we show up. Um, I appreciate um, all that what you just said. Um, Jordan, speak to what our panelists have been saying, what, what are the other barriers or, or you know, building on what they've been saying, what, what's, what's stopping men from joining? Uh, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take it from a different direction. It doesn't mean that any of us are right or any of us are wrong. It's, it's different perspectives and it's when you're trying to shift culture, it, it's about, coming at it from all directions and recognizing all of the little bits that builds toward a greater, you know, that build toward a culture. And if our culture is here right now, we want to be here. We need to sort of pull down from the top and build something new and then build it up over here, right? And uh, so this will tie back into an experience or a conversation I had that could have been part of my answer to your first question, Joe. Uh, about an aha moment, but I had a really uh, empowering conversation with a good friend a couple of years ago, almost several years ago now, and this is a gentleman who, who identified as a gay man, who we having a conversation about the gender discrimination that he has faced in his life and the space that was taken away from him as a young, a young boy playing hockey. And it started a, as his, his journey through hockey, through sport, was being a part of a team. And then he recognized that language and uh, competition and speak and atmosphere, the whole space was moving ahead without him. He felt excluded because of his sexual orientation. He knew it was something he was hiding. And so he he fell back to become a goalie because he felt that that was the only space where he could be a part of the team that separated from pardon me, the bullshit. And then as he got into his teen years, it just became too much. And, you know, you're developing your sexual identity even more and he had to cut it off completely and leave hockey. And so we talked about the spaces. His message to me was those people who are in a space of modeling behavior, need to first take control of what's wrong at the top and pull it down and rebuild a new structure. And, you know, I'll go back to some of what Anthony's touching on the culture of, of athletics and the things that coaches say to us, Anthony, and I grew up playing football all my years too. I mean, I think we may have even crossed each other on the field in university for one season, but the messages you convey from your coach is some things my football coaches said to me, and it's this message I carry with my kids, and Anthony talks about role modeling for his children, but starting to see those kids in the community as your children, too, that are eating up the message, right? 
whether you're in an influential position or whether you're just a grown man walking the mailbox, how are those kids perceiving the model citizen that you're putting out there? And, and at the end of the day, my message to the kids that I'm trying to have an influence on, and in fact, we're approaching uh, specifically, or, or the majority of my work in the community as a coach, is it, it's exactly what Anthony said. It's what our coaches said to us is, are, did you give the world the best version of yourself today? Right? So Anthony's talking about, you know, the game, did you give the best version of yourself, the best effort? But how does that transcend into life? And that's, that, that's the message of sport. We're not trying to lift kids into professional sport. We're trying to lift kids into citizenship so that they know how to carry the best version of themselves out into the community. So we take those two messages and you talk about building a new culture. And it's facing that challenge. It, it's too often, to answer this question, too often men in our generation have had the easy way out that there are those opportunities that Omar and Anthony talked about. And it's, do you choose to grab a hold of that opportunity? And quite honestly, it's too easy for most of us to just go, yeah, it's too easy. It, you know, I, it's unfortunate that the majority here tonight with us are women. It's too easy for the men to not show up when it matters. But the more we talk about these things, the more we tear certain aspects of our culture down to rebuild something new, more men will show up. They just need to have that space where they look and they go, wow, that guy's doing it. So we're doing it. And it's not to boast that the five of us are sitting here doing it, but we are collectively building something new, you know, those new building blocks. And, you know, as an example, I'll, I'll talk about being a coach and addressing you and call, call the shit out. Yeah. It's, a, it's appalling what an eight-year-old and a nine-year-old already knows and has already been modeled. And if you can have your little influence to say, you know, that's not acceptable. And those are those microaggressions yep. that uh, Todd was talking about. It's that it's then seven, eight, nine years old. Guys, that's, there's no place for that in a dressing room and there's no place for that in life. And if yeah. you have that just honest, friendly conversation with kids, you're going to start to build that, you know, that new culture. Yes, I love that. And, you know, in, in bringing those conversations up and and using relationships that, that we have within our lives, um, yeah, to, to, to promote just a healthy way of being uh, in the world. Uh, and like has come up several times uh, throughout our conversation today, building a community and building a place that we want to live in. Um, and, you know, and from what I've heard from, from you folks it, it, through that is, you know, the relationships that we have with each other in that is how we are going to do exactly what you said, Jordan, break things down and build it back up. Um, we have to, you know, yeah, the, that uh, stronger together and, and utilizing our relationships uh, is how we're going to see change. So my, my next question uh, to you folks is, Really, how can we like? What are some practical things, um, like a like tangible things? Trying to trying to start to create our playbook, Anthony. Um, you know, to for for men to go about, uh, you know, leveraging those relationships, talking with other men, um, and what what advice could could you give to men who who wanted to do that, or or how could you be a mentor? Um, <clears throat> I think for, for me, I think there's a, there's a couple of things, um, first and foremost, and I think that we can probably all relate to this in this day and age, uh, this is probably one of the hardest things to do, but I, but I think to be present is about the most important thing that we can do. And, and what I mean by that is we've got to be there in the time that people need us to be there. Okay. And you never know when that time's going to be. So the only way you can achieve that is to be present in the moment, whenever anything's going on, whatever it may be, because like you said, you never know what's going on with people. Todd was talking about those folks that he knew that something wasn't quite right. Um, you know, and stuff started to come out and, you know, there, it's really easy for us to, um, Oh, that guy's having a bad day. Oh, they're just whatever. And we just kind of, and we kind of let it be, 
or we can legitimately be present. And when we ask somebody a question, Hey, how's your day? We actually care to hear the response, not, Oh, Hey, how's your day? Oh, that's good. And we're scrolling, right? Whatever that may be. If we can legitimately be present and, and mean it when we say, Hey, how's your day? Is it, what's going on with you? How's the family? How's whatever, but mean it and wait for the response. And, and when you think about when somebody asks you that, um, and I know it happens to me now, like I've got this one guy that I work with, you know, I know he's got all kinds of stuff going on at, at home and, um, you know, financially, that sort of thing, but he goes out of his way to, Hey man, is everything okay? You know, he, he every time, even though he's got whatever he's got going on at home, he will make sure to, and he, and he'll sit there and look you in the eyes and wait for your response and, and, you know, go from there. And, and that's the type of people that I think ultimately if we can surround ourselves by, um, with those people and be more like them in terms of being present, um, wanting to know how things are going for people and then being ready for whatever that response may be. And how can we then be of assistance? You know, it's not shameful to feel bad for somebody when they've got something going on in their life. It's not shameful to em empathize and say, Hey, I've been there. It's okay. That what that is, is that's being human. You know, that's accepting that there's people that are having struggles um, and they need somebody to, to pick them up. Um, I think that, you know, beyond that, how do we, I don't know, how do we, um, how do people get involved who want to get involved? Um, in addition to being present, I think we need to be aware and open our eyes a little bit. You can't just, you know, shut, you know, put your blinders on and, and shut off to what's going on out there in the world um, as far as what we deem to be okay. And I think that that's, that's the part for me that's, I would say the most challenging when you think about how things are societally, um, you know, what's okay as a joke, what's okay as this, what we've accepted as normal. Um, and I, and I say this often when I'm, when I'm talking to the kids and facilitating these, these conversations is just because it's normal, just because we see it every day and we've accepted it as normal doesn't mean that it's okay. And so we have to, we have to go, we have to shift and talking about, you know, building back up, we have to shift the way that we um, treat things just because they're normal doesn't mean that they're okay. And we have to look at, okay, now that I've accepted and acknowledged that this thing's not okay, how am I going to view it going forward? How am I going to treat this action going forward? It can be something as simple as, you know, Hey, yeah, uh, take a look at this thing here. You know what this person sent me, whatever. And we just say, you know what? Hey man, I don't want to see that. Right. It's like, it's not some crazy, robust, grand gesture. It's simple stuff. Of, oh, okay. He doesn't want to see that weird, you know? And now you've put that little shadow of a doubt in that person's mind about, should I share this again? Or should I? And that little stuff like that can really um, shift the culture of, again, what we deem to be okay. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. And then that acting as an example, and I loved how you inserted, uh, you know, yourself in, into that and, and how would you, um, you know, say these things to, to, to people in a, in a way that's, that's real for you. Um, Omar, I, I see you've unmuted yourself as well. Do you have, a, do you have thoughts? Yeah, I, I really appreciate what, what Anthony was saying. One of the things that I pull from that is, you know, it's, it's not really about what others do, it's about what we're doing, right? And how are we holding ourselves to account, right? How are we thinking about our behaviors and what we can be doing? And if we think about the, um, you know, the root of the solution is, is how we conduct ourselves, right? How are we holding ourselves accountable in the different situations we're in? That might be uh, through calling things out. It might be also through... Um, you know, demonstrating vulnerability, offering additional support, thinking about all of those things, treating it as our issue. Right? Yes, T treating that as our issue um, and, and uh, yeah, bringing those conversations in, into the forefront of our relationships. I quite often hear about, you know, folks feeling uncomfortable or like they don't know enough to actually start 
you know, speaking out and you hear people saying, you know, fake it, fake it till you make it. But what I've heard from both you and Anthony is that we need to start being it till we are it um, and, and start going into things. Um, and so thank you for, for what you just said there, uh, Omar. Uh, Jordan, I, I'm going to come to you. So you're waving. Joe, I love it. Let's not fake it till we make it. I'm going to, what Anthony said about, okay, so lean into somebody and just ask them sincerely and hold on them until they answer you. Um, and then what you said, Anthony, was be prepared to receive what they, what they come at you with. And so I think maybe it's that little moment of realizing, shit, I'm going to have to be vulnerable here. And so we don't even go into it. So let's reverse engineer that. Take a course. That's how I ended up falling into my sociology degree. I had done all my, you know, I'd done all my science and my master's and all that. And I just thought, how can I actually lean into my community a little bit better? I don't even know where to start. Let's take a course. Every university's got them. They've got them by distance. You know, community colleges have them. I started at Athabasca. A list of courses, advocacy from the margins. And the, the, the immense amount of information that came to me, oh, okay, I know how to accept someone when I'm vulnerable. How do I actually offer them the right tools? How do I be there for them? How do I raise their voice up instead of telling them they're wrong or trampling all over it, influencing them with my bias, right? So it's courses, it's educate yourself uh, just a little bit. And I think it, the other aspect, it builds a bit on what Omar was talking about and, and what we talked about earlier is, is seizing an opportunity. And the opportunities are those small things. I, I firmly believe in children. Maybe you can call me cynical and I've given up on all of us adults or whatever, but I'm so invested in the children. In the community. And, and there are your opportunities. If you have any moment in your day where your role in whatever aspect of your life it is that brings you in contact with even one child, it's how can you give them an opportunity to start to navigate their world and make decisions which are, are good and are healthy for everybody, not just for their space, but for those who occupy space around them. And so I think it's not only taking your own opportunity, but seizing, off, seizing to to give a child a chance to recognize where their opportunities lie, because they're going to be our, our greatest hope once we've started to lay those first layers of the culture, right? Um, and lastly, without being too indulgent, letting Todd get in on it, I, I want to make a remark just to uh, the fact, again, uh, that there are so many women here with us tonight. And, and this might not be right for all men, I don't want to stereotype it, but I guess this is the advice I would give to uh, anyone who identifies as a woman in the crowd team. Instead of elbowing the men in your life into getting involved, just talk about some other men you're seeing who are already involved. And it might not be us. I'm not trying to go out and talk about Anthony and Bob and Omar and I. It's, if, you, if you see something on the news, if you see something in entertainment, you see your favorite comedian, even speak up in a way that is changing the way jokes are delivered, right? There are so many intelligent comedians and entertainers and critics out there, men who are speaking up, and you can sort of go, oh, wow, that really impressed me. I think that impacts us men. I, I will say I'm impacted more by my partner when they certain, just remark about something they saw in the day that impacted them. I go, hmm. I sit back and I go, okay, I see this. I see how this is impacting people close to me and maybe I can be more like that and be impactful as well so mm -hmm. hope that makes some sense yeah yeah it for sure does it and those uh those pieces and, and how we bring people into the conversation is, is so uh so important and yeah that that approach uh I, I liked what you said about that and I want to come to you uh Todd but I do want to go back um Quickly, Anthony, uh, and we're going to go to questions too soon from uh, the audience, so please get those in. But Anthony, I'm curious, I just maybe create a bit more clear. We have a great conversations around the importance of relationships and nurturing kind of that vulnerability amongst men. But could you maybe speak a little bit to how 
you know, doing that and those practices amongst men is connected to uh, ending men's violence against women. Absolutely. I think that, um, I guess there's a, there's a few different avenues here, but, um, you know, one of the frequent things that we hear, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit to, um, how do I say this, services after the fact, okay, and then also uh, how I believe it will end, end violence, um, uh, you know, from a grassroots level. And so I think that, you know, one of the, one of the frequent things that we hear, and you know this uh, all too well, Joe, is that um, ultimately, you know, women are often afraid to leave a domestic violence um, situation, to leave a violent relationship um, because they don't have anyone that they can trust uh, because their fear of reprisal of what may happen if I try to leave. Um, there's the financial reason. There's, there's numerous reasons why. And so I think that in, in trying to you know, connect everything back um, in terms of how can we connect um, authentically is when we authentically connect with people, it builds trust. And I think that when you think about if somebody's trying to leave a domestic violence situation, um, they need to have somebody they can trust. Okay. And so when we can build an environment of trust with those around us, it might not be a direct connection between us and that person. It's maybe that, you know, I connect with you in an authentic manner and you're like, wow, I really, I was really felt something there. Like it really, like he actually cares. Awesome. And the next person that you encounter um, you know, you deliver that same level of authenticity, they might be willing to confide in you about what's going on in their life. Right. So I think that there's a connection in, in that aspect. And then I think that, you know, in terms of men, ultimately um, in terms of how can we uh, end domestic violence, if we're authentically connecting with people and, and just being real and actually wanting to hear and, and empathize and, um, just be vulnerable for the people around us and say, Hey, you know, I legitimately want to know what you've got going on in your life. Perhaps we catch something before it ever gets to that point of violence. Somebody's just having financial struggles at home, you know, and they, whatever it may be, they need, you know, they need food on their table, whatever, like who's to say what that thing is. But if we're authentic about, Hey, I want to help you out. And, you know, maybe you can put food on the table for that evening it's not that stressor for them then that leads to the next thing, right? So there's so many ways in which we can be impactful and it's those little positive, as much as it's the little things we're doing here and there and saying, hey, don't do that. Or hey, sometimes it's those little positive sentiments that we do for somebody that's gonna change their outlook for the better. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, talking earlier about um, microaggressions and now uh, I think what you're talking about is you know a micro action um, that we can can really take uh, within our relationships and um, the power of those and being able to you know notice uh, domestic violence prevent domestic violence uh, and like we say create the, the life uh, or, or create a community that we want to live in uh, we're going to go to audience questions right now and Todd we're going to come uh, Come at you right now. And Alyssa, do we have any uh, questions coming in from the audience? Yeah, we do. Uh, so I've got uh, the question here. Can someone share a specific example of when they have called out a toxic behavior and what happened? Awesome. Todd. Um, gosh, where to begin? Um, I don't want to go back to the, the uh, family unit that I spoke about before, but uh, in the... There's a lot going on in my head right now, and I have to revisit what Anthony was talking about, but the importance of being present. Um, I think that one of the reasons why there's um, an archetype of men uh, not listening is, and we, we often don't because we're actually afraid of what we're going to hear. We're afraid that maybe we're going to be presented with a problem that we can't solve or a problem that we started. Uh, and when it comes to um, the power of attending behavior uh, and, and allowing people to feel like they're listened, what I found when I've listened to men, when I've finally been able to break through a bit of a shell um, and some of those walls and some of those barriers is that they don't know how they're going to fit anymore in a paradigm of equity or quality or, or, or something that is different where it's not um, a traditional hierarchy. And they just, for a lot of the peers that I had, once again, in this particular uh, cultural aspect, 
they didn't know how to operate. They were uncertain of themselves. And these were men who were often, when they stepped outside of a box and made a mistake, they were punished for it. So I don't, I used to, one of the ways that I grew and, you know, it's still a process. Growth is a process. There are some times that I can be a caustic jerk uh, where I'm intolerant to the point where some of, and, you know, I read my audience. I try to communicate in a way that's attractive and accessible to the audience that I'm trying to impart some knowledge on. Sometimes that's being a little bit rough and gruff with my language, but other times it's also allowing that person to be vulnerable, but it's also, um, it's trying to reinforce to people that when there is some sort of equity going on, either in a work relationship or around a board table or in a family relationship or in a culture, that that is not a threat that somebody I'm, I'm a six foot three middle-aged white guy. And ostensibly this entire culture has been made for me. And there are a lot of people who look like me and are in my station who were born on third base and act like they hit a triple to get there. And when I try to talk about uh, issues of um, privilege and acknowledgement, it doesn't mean that guys like me have not suffered or struggled or, or, or uh, been affected by loss. It just means that we recognize that so many other people in order to attain what we have, have got it so much worse. And there is no shame in that, in, in pulling something up to our level, as opposed to trying to push people down to maintain an unequal eye thou. Yeah. And I'm sorry, Alyssa, where was that question that uh, I just dodged? <laughs> it was in the question and answer. So that was great. Thank you so much, Todd. Yeah. Welcome. Yeah, I appreciate that. Omar, um, I'm curious to know, do you, do you have thoughts around that and, and what Todd was saying and in calling out kind of toxic behaviors and in those experiences? I, I think it's it's really important. There's, there's another question in the Q&A that talked about, about toxic masculinity. I think there's something in some of these questions where oftentimes we think avoiding masculinity is the solution, but I think there's there's actually a place where we can embrace what is authentic masculinity, right? And reframing it as, as that is important because I think there are important masculine and feminine attributes. And if we think about, you know, what, what would, you know, authentic male attributes do in this situation, right? If we think about calling things out when they are wrong, right? That's a traditional tendency of masculine courage. Right? And framing it in like those positive senses, the positive associations we do have with masculinity, not eviscerating masculinity is important because if we say masculinity is a problem, people who are masculine will feel problematic. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And I think that comes back to, to what you were saying earlier too about, uh, yeah, masculinity and there, there is, you know, issues kind of within the way that that's constructed but it's also an opportunity um the way that it's, it's constructed to, to 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 break down and rebuild kind of that uh that that culture that we have around talking about uh about this um yeah jordan you, you're going to speak to the, i think you can use like omar saying let's not run away from masculinity and and, and reshape a culture over a sort of a singular nature of gender, um, let's look at what is masculinity. Masculinity is um, teamwork, it's play. Dudes love to play. Um, you know, I'm not saying that, that girls don't come together in teamwork and, you know, we can go, go down a whole, uh, I can talk all about sociology and biology and gender and, all of that stuff. And we know where we're all gonna go with that. These are qualities that overlay, well, every individual has masculinity and femininity in it. But if we wanna lead with the masculinity approach, break through, even with your adult friends, through play and through teamwork in those moments. You know, when you talk about visiting a, a therapist and really breaking through in conversation, it's while you're coloring. Right? And I know that's most often an approach used with children, sometimes with adults. I've sat with my therapist in color. But 
lean into those moments as opportunities to have these hard conversations, right? That's how you encourage the conversation, finding what is the very best of masculinity, not what is the toxic um, collision course of banging heads like two rams in a mountain, but, uh, you know, teamwork, a herd, going out together. Anthony, I'll let you have the dinos, but I was the bison, so I'm going to talk about a herd of bisons, you know, going out and, and heading in the same direction together, circling up around each other when needed, and doing it in a in an atmosphere of fun and play. So I think those are incredible qualities. Yeah, with kids and adults. Yeah, and that that attitude and demeanor which we bring into these uh, conversations. Um, yeah, it does start with that that working through that fear of leaning into a conversation, leaning into who you are and, 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 uh, and, and how we, uh, how we want to be in the world we want to create. Uh, Alyssa, we got another question in the chat. What, what, what are we hearing? Yeah. So, uh, someone says, how do the panelists think they have space to grow in shifting the culture to end violence against women? Interesting question. So about, um, areas where panelists can, can show growth or want to grow in, in their journey in ending violence. Uh, Omar, I'm curious if you, if you have any thoughts uh, around this question in, in terms of growth. I, I'm thinking about it from, from an organizational perspective, right? And as an organization, how do we move from, um, from a focus on social service to an expanding our thought about social change? Right, so not just being downstream, but being upstream as well, right? If we're not tackling the systemic issues that lead to violence, what can we expect to change, right? I think all too often when we think about the challenge, it's like we're, it's like if we're talking about a kitchen right now, right? And uh, we're just, and we have a leaky tap and we focus on, let's get a bigger sink. Misses the point, right? The problem isn't the size of the sink. The problem is the leaky tap. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Omar. I think that's basically, yeah, just that, 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 you know, we're not, we're not, we're not broken and we can all get better and, and improve and move forward. Um, I think it's such an important sentiment for folks to take away. Um, Todd, um, what about, what about you in terms of like, your growth uh, in, in, in your involvement in this issue as an ally. Uh, can you speak to that? Yeah, I think I can. I know that, you know, I've come to a, a place in an age and a station in which I find myself questioning a lot more of my attitudes and beliefs and statements and paying closer attention to what I'm saying, not out of fear of offense, but out of fear of wanting to make sure that I'm speaking in a way that is inclusive, that is not um, shutting somebody else down. Uh, and it's growth is not a destination. It's something that is always happening. And it, interestingly enough, I'm probably the most secure and confident I've been um, professionally and personally than I ever have been in my own life. Yet at the same time, I've also are actively checking myself, checking my head, checking if I'm thinking in terms of um, a, a colonial mindset, a, a, a way that is um, unnecessarily hierarchical and are there so there are so many different ways that we can function in our culture uh, you know i was raised in the 80s and 90s and a lot of the attitudes that were just the norm around there are things that we're actively rebelling against and trying to tear down now as we should uh, and i find that you know it's not a fear motivation but i do have um, a real concern and i give a lot of forethought and active thought to how I communicate with the world around me, am I being as inclusive as possible and not taking anything for granted, uh, trying not to make assumptions about individuals. But I've got a willingness about me to check my perception and check my head probably more often than not, definitely more than I did say 10, 15, 20 years ago. Todd, thank you so much for having, having that willingness. And that does take, uh, yeah, a certain person and, and and you know you need to be a, cer a certain amount of humble to be able to to do that and i appreciate you as a, as a leader and as a man who's been speaking about this issue for a long time that you're still thinking about that and, and that there's ways to 
to to grow it and learn. And I appreciate you bringing that in, that in. Um, Todd, did I ask you around that question too? Around areas where you see growth for yourself? Oh, uh, for myself? Oh, sorry. I oh, said no, I Todd. Think, I met yeah, Jordan. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's my bad. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, you know what? I think Todd's nailed it for what I have. I've really been, I'll, I'll fully admit I'm, I, I grew up in my late thirties. Uh, and, and I really, uh, um, how do I put this while still being respectful of myself in a public forum? Um, I took away a lot of other people's space through my 20s uh, based on my own demons. Let's just put it that way. And uh, leaning into deeper education, deeper purpose for my life, um, deeper love for my spouse, those were the things that sort of uh, really shifted my focus to what Todd's talking about. So uh, I'm in an infancy of a work in progress to that mindset of constantly checking myself. And so I, I am really eager to see what, you know, 40s bring, what 50s and 60s bring, you know. Um, uh, so yeah, it, it's, been, it's been a really positive last five years. And for, you know, I'll say this, it's, it's funny because uh, I have been someone who's lived a very public life from my adulthood. And in my last five years, many people who know me here in Calgary uh, may think that what they've seen of me publicly has probably been the most negative five years in my life. But in fact, it's been leaning in, being more introverted and more self reflective has actually made me a better person and a person that's decided to shift direction and have greater hands on impact in my community. So that's, that's the growth in progress right now. Yeah, thank you so much for, for sharing that part. And, uh, yeah, your journey specifically in the last uh, while, I, I appreciate that uh, so much. And again, just uh, fr from all of you folks, just the, that, you know, knowledge around we need, we, we can do better, we can learn more uh, and, and not stopping is something that I thank all of you truly for, for um, for not for doing for not stopping. Thank you for that. We have one more question, um, Alyssa. Yeah. So, um, just kind of a rapid fire question. Um, if you can give us your uh, quickest thoughts on, have you seen change in your life by modeling these answers you've discussed, and if so, how uh, specifically in yourself? Uh, changes in yourself through through what we've just kind of talked, Anthony. I would love to go to you. Um, <clears throat> I guess I'd say for me, um, I'm a super like highly competitive, everything like it, it doesn't matter what it is. I want to win at it. Right. And so I'd say that if there's something that I've learned from, from modeling everything that we've, um, discussed, it would be that everything in life isn't like a zero sum game. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't have to be, you know, I win, you lose. And so I think that in, in living the day-to-day, -day, uh, particularly in a professional setting, um, understanding that just because you help somebody else be successful isn't somehow taking away from your own potential success. And I think that that's something that if we can implement that in all that we do, um, it will make us, you know, just that much better people and the people around us um, will be so much better for it. So I think for me, um, that's really the big thing is just, just acknowledging that you can, you know, again, I, it was mentioned a little bit before, but, um, you can pull somebody up, uh, on your way up. You don't necessarily have to be, you know, pushing them back down. So, Hey, can I pipe in here and say, Anthony, absolutely for everyone, read the book called, I don't know who the author is, but read the book called the end of homework. Okay. And it talks about competitiveness versus cooperation, how we build that competitiveness by assigning homework to children and then how we could shift sort of the mindset into cooperation and lifting other people up. Just Absolutely. A, a awesome. Impacted me a few years ago. Beautiful. 
Yeah. For sure. Omar, I see. Uh, are you having to react? Do you want to react to, to what, what we're just saying here? I'm, I'm agreeing with the sentiments, right? Um, yeah. I think personally, I've seen, I think the, the more we realize that this is self-work, the, the better we become, right? The, the issue of tackling violence is not an existential or external threat. It's, um, it's self-work. Right? It's how we show up uh, ourselves with the people around us, how we show up to support the people around us, how we think about problems, how we deal with our own baggage. Um, you know, those are the precursors. Those are the essentials. And so I feel you know, the more I've gone down this journey, the more I've learned about myself, the more, um, the more aware I, I am of how I show up with other people, uh, of my deficiencies in those many 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 situations and uh the, the more work i realize i need to do yeah yeah um thank you uh so much uh for for that omar about yeah that constant you know improvement um and, and betterment of yourself it, it's a, it's a hard practice to to make a part of your life but but i it, what you just said is is so on with what we've been talking about and creating that that community where we want to live. Todd, can I go to you to to speak a little bit about this as well? Yeah, I'm. Um, there's there's a lot of good things coming from this conversation that are getting me thinking. And you know, we're talking about um, uh, competition. I was I was never a kid who was really competitive. I was kind of, and I still am, stupidly naive. Where you know, why can't we? I I, I see better things come from collaboration and cooperation and. Um, I know that coming through the last couple of years of shutdown, I realized how much I kind of bought into this notion of I am what I contribute to my, um, my business. I, I am my job. And as soon as the job was taken away, as soon as a career path was taken away, I was really, I went through a, a significant amount of darkness trying to figure out what the hell I was. Um, and I felt there was a shame kind of downward spiral about that because, uh, Without my job, without a career, you know, I was producing live music and live events that were all of a sudden no call for a festival producer anymore. And when I found myself, I always thought, you know, I would never define myself based upon what I did. And then I, I surprised myself at, you know, when that was taken away, um, how easy it was for me to, at some point, want to give up. And then I started how I kind of pulled myself out of that. And I'm still in that process, even though I've got um, I'm, my career back on track. I'm still kind of um, reeling from just how many of my peers, how many of my personal friends and contacts are still stuck in that way where I've never seen so many people um, who valued their uh, self-sufficiency all of a sudden start questioning who they were because their ability to be self-sufficient uh, was taken away from them. And, you know, when it comes towards the things that I still have to do to grow is that is still um, uh, waking me up to how much of these external uh, aspects of my life and my character informed internally my psyche and who I was. Um, and you know, I'm still not over this stuff. It, it's a process of recovery. Uh, and I never want to put myself in a position where I'm devaluing myself because how can I, how can I value other people if I'm ultimately devaluing myself? Um, and to me, that's once again, going to be a lifelong process. When I figure it out, I'll probably be on my deathbed. Mm. <laughs> yeah i thank you for, for those thoughts around that you know that this is a a process and that can feel i think it can feel overwhelming to hear all the what we've talked about tonight uh to learn all that we uh you know have to to talk about when it comes to ending violence um but making it practice making it you know part of our routine uh, and bringing it into our relationships uh, to create the, that world free from violence, uh, where people don't have to feel unsafe to be uh, who they are, uh, to be in a relationship and to be loved. Uh, it's what it's about. Um, so uh, peace and love to you, gentlemen. Thank you for uh, this conversation. Uh, it, it's really been a pleasure to, and an honor to be a part of. Uh, I'm going to pass things back um, to uh, my two colleagues, uh, Jill and Alyssa. 
Thank you so much, Joe. And thank you, Jordan, Omar, Anthony, and Todd for your courageous and for your insightful discussion with us tonight. Um, I love where we came to, uh, you know, by the end of the conversation, we came to the beginning, which is really that aspect of self-work uh, and that self-work will lead us closer to connection, which will lead us closer to active relation with one another and healthy, strong, supportive, collaborative relation. So we really appreciate uh, everything that you've brought tonight uh, as part of this panel um, and have been able to share with everyone who's been in attendance. Um, thank you, Joe, for moderating this evening as well. We really appreciate you. Um, before we end for the night, we have a few uh, messages we wanna share. Uh, another really important thing that we can all do in addition to um, engaging with each other in these conversations actively, openly, uh, I think as Alyssa said, with, with open ears and open hearts at the beginning. Um, another important thing that we can do as we're on the eve of the 16 days of activism is to think about supporting our local organizations. Um, you can support ACWS uh, at this time of year, at any time of year, a, a fun fundamental way of doing that is to donate. We'll be putting our link for donations into the chat right away. We are a registered charity, um, so we do count on support from folks like you to help us continue our work. Um, with that, I'll pass it to Alyssa to share a few more ways to get involved during Family Violence Prevention Month. Thank you. Thanks, Jill. So once again, I do want to remind folks that this panel is not the end of possible routes to help end violence in our communities and across Alberta. Rather, it's a beginning. We welcome and encourage you to continue to engage with us. You can also go to our website, which is in the chat to explore more about our work, uh, how we can work together and about resources like the Leading Change Expansion Pack. Uh, there is also an evaluation link for you in the chat and we would greatly appreciate your feedback. On behalf of ACWS, I want to sincerely thank all of you for attending and participating in our annual Breakfast with the Guys event. The work we do to prevent violence is not possible without the open ears and open hearts of the community. Thank you again. Good night, everybody, and stay safe and healthy.